I was a hardcore fundamentalist, full preterist for many years, when I was excommunicated from the Presbyterian Church for saying that the second coming of Jesus already happened. That's right. I believed that the Redeemer didn't need any redeeming because he did come back. And he kept his word when he said, Some of you standing here will not taste death before the Son of Man comes in his kingdom or with his angels to repay each man according to their deeds. I found all of these expectations of the soon end in the New Testament. But I couldn't see that the Savior needed saving himself. The Redeemer needed redeeming himself. Because when he said these things, he was wrong. The Apostle Paul was also wrong about the end. He expected that this would happen sometime soon, within his own lifetime, and it didn't happen. So we pick apart these ideas in this episode with legendary scholar John J. Collins. And we deal with very basic fundamentals to show you that movements and ideas like full preterism are found wanting. Yeah, I get it. They want to save the Savior. But in reality, it's really wrong. Vision. I'm so stoked again today to have Dr. John J. Collins on, a legend in Hebrew Bible scholarship. I mean, I've got, uh, if I could brag just a second, I only, and I only grabbed a couple. I got a couple books here. Some of these are really old. Uh, in fact, they will one day probably be worth a lot of money because they came directly from your office, Dr. Collins. <laughs> if we, if you don't mind us mythologizing you when you're long gone, I, I, yeah. you might even say there was an apotheosis. Who knows? We'll, we'll figure it out. But welcome back to Myth Vision. Glad to be back. So, Dr. Collins, you've been on quite a few times, and our audience mostly knows who you are. But for those who don't, can you tell us just briefly your credentials? And what makes you an expert in this mm -hmm. field? Well, I got my PhD from Harvard in 1972. I wrote a dissertation then on the Sibylline oracles of Egyptian Judaism. But then I got into working on apocalypticism. And I wrote an early monograph on Daniel and a form critical commentary on Daniel. I did a big Hermeneia commentary on Daniel came out in the early 90s. And uh, then I, I taught for a year in Dublin and uh, then came back to the States, taught at various places, um, Notre Dame for six years, uh, University of Chicago for nine, and then for 21 at Yale Divinity School. And, and retired there. Just, just retired last year, but I'm actually teaching a course this semester uh, to fill in until my replacement arrives. Wow. Yeah, yeah. I was there the week you retired and we interviewed last year. So I, yes. <laughs> it was really interesting. And, and thank you for that time and your time yeah. today. I, I wanted to cover some of the basics here while we dive into the New Testament, because I, I feel like we can't quite know the New Testament if we don't back up sometimes and figure out where this idea comes from. And the idea is apocalypticism. Can you tell us what that is? How is apocalypticism related to eschatology? And we'll go from there. Okay. Eschatology, first of all, is potentially at least the easier of the two. It's eschatology is talk about the end. Now, there are a lot of books on eschatology. There have been for nearly 2,000 years. A lot of times what they're talking about is the fate of the soul after death. Uh, sometimes the end of the world. But there are both those aspects to it. Now, 
You can also talk about eschatology in the Hebrew prophets. The prophet Amos, for example, says, the end will come upon my people Israel. But that's the way the end is now coming upon the Ukraine. You know, it was a political, military invasion. But that's what he was talking about. Um, so, you know, there, there were lesser ends, so to speak. Now, in apocalypticism, the word apocalypse means revelation. Just the Greek word for revelation. But it tends to get used just with reference to a particular kind of revelation. Uh, by and large, the kind of thing that resembles what you find in the book of Revelation in the New Testament. That's where the word comes from. I don't mean that that's where the whole genre comes from, but that's where the word comes from. Now, <clears throat> the Revelation is also called a prophecy, and a lot of the material in it is about the future. Uh, but it's a different kind of prophecy from Amos or Isaiah. And one of the big differences between them is that in the, the books we call apocalypses, uh, first of all, they're all highly visionary. Well, some prophecy is visionary too. But you hardly get any oracles. You know, thus saith the Lord. You get a few of those in the book of Revelation, but you hardly get any of them in the, the Jewish apocalypses. So it's a much more visual form of revelation. And what it, so the, the, um, they don't harangue the reader and say, you should do this, you should not do that. If you do this, you'll be cursed. Uh, what they do is describe a situation. So they might show you a vision of God coming down in judgment or of the dead being raised and taken to a judgment scene. And then you draw your own conclusions from that. That's more the way it works. But beyond that, uh, the books that we call apocalyptic first appear in Judaism in probably the second century BC. Possibly some parts go back a little bit earlier than that. So it's a Hellenistic phenomenon. Okay, okay. This is getting somewhere because I guess uh, what we're going to be doing is is as we go along is kind of seeing what is the New Testament doing? And that's... Yes. It's, but, oh, let, yes. Let me say first of all, okay. that the big difference between apocalypticism and prophecy isn't just a matter of the form. They're, they're, the form is tweaked. But more important is the content. And I mentioned three things in particular. One is that, um, you know, history and human affairs are to a great degree decided by supernatural beings. Angels, demons, what have you. Could give you an example of that for the book of Daniel. Uh, there's when the Jews and Greeks are fighting on earth, there's really a battle between the archangel Michael and the prince of Greece mm. in heaven. That's the way they see it. Secondly, they tend to view history as a unit. And that means that it can come to an end. And they do talk about the end of history in a way that the earlier prophets did not. Now, the end of history doesn't mean that there won't be any history after it. It means something, some radical change a radical change in the conditions of human life. And then the third thing, which is in many ways, I think the most decisive difference is that it assumes that there will be a judgment of the dead. So resurrection, not necessarily bodily resurrection, but a judgment of the dead. Okay. You know, before that, you went to Sheol, whether you were good or bad. And now... You could go up, you could go down. <laughs> okay, this is going to lead us into the direction I'd love to go, judgment of the dead. So I'm going to bring up a couple pericope here, if you don't mind. Um, let's go. I, 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 my, my buddy, Stephen Nelson, I have to give a shout out to him because he kicks butt on doing these. And really, I think it's uh, fascinating to have visuals for people to learn. 
like yeah. an example. We'll, and it may not take you, but two sentences to answer, and we can move on to another one because I have a, a few that I'd love to get through. In 1 Corinthians, Paul writes, for example, I think God has exhibited us, the apostles, last of all, all as men, condemned to death, because we have become a spectacle to the world, both to angels and to mankind. We see this notion in Paul's writings in 1 Corinthians as well. Do you not know that the saints will judge the world? And after the world is to be judged by you, are you incom incompetent to try trivial cases? Do you not know that we are to judge angels to say nothing of ordinary matters? So just as an example, and we'll pop back to get into the next pericope, what is Paul, what does he mean by you will judge angels? What does it mean to judge the world? Because some people I know that come from the background that I have, for example, they're called preterist. They want to make world mean covenant people or world mean just Israel or some limited scope. What does Paul yeah, mean? I, I don't think Paul intends a limited scope. I think he really means judge the world. Now, by that, what he means is, you know, that there will be a, a big universal judgment and that the, the early Christians, the ones he's calling holy ones, uh, will be on the jury. Simple as that. And the, the angels, angels. Yeah. the angels that are being judged, those are actual divine beings and they will be above them. Okay, cool. Yeah. Yeah. We're on the same page. Uh, I, I would say, though, that you don't get that idea very much. Right. It, it's, it's a minor point that's kind of thrown in in passing. Okay. Next pericope, then. Uh, we're in Hebrews now. But as it is, he appeared once for all at the end of the ages to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. Yeah. What is meant by the end of the ages here, Dr. Collins? That's you know what we would otherwise call the end of history. Now, what happens after it is another matter, but it's the point that history is building up to and at which God intervenes and there is a big judgment. So, you know, in the book of Daniel, you have four kingdoms, supposedly, four beasts coming up out of the sea. Well, these are all each an age. And now you come to the end of the ages and you have the, the showdown and the, the judgment. <laughs> now, you see, in, in some apocalypses, I think uh, it is, and maybe Daniel is one of them, I think, uh, life goes on on earth after the judgment. But in other apocalypses, you know, there's really a new creation. The old earth and the old heaven are wrapped up and put away and uh, everything behold and make all things new it says in revelation may i may i bring us to that pericope for a second because that is an interesting one i wanted to, we're in the gospels now and mm -hmm. i want to skip to this one nobody can really see it very well but i i just want to like emphasize for the audience to know in matthew 24 mark 13 luke 21 what i like to call the synoptic apocalypse it seems uh or maybe apocalypse isn't the right term i just kind of call it this um he talks about heaven and earth will pass away. Now there are some people, some people <laughs> who want to say heaven and earth is not heaven and earth and that it's yeah. a covenant people or some redefinition. What is meant by heaven and earth in Matthew, Luke and, and uh, Mark. And if I may add a caveat to give you a little deeper probe, what is going on in these passages? Because the people think Jesus said, these are the signs of the end of the age. Here we are with yeah. the end of the age again, and heaven and earth will pass away. Um, then all things will be new, like a new heaven and new earth is the idea that's going to come. They yeah. believe that, that Matthew 24, Luke 21 and Mark 13 was fulfilled. It actually happened. So they find a way to package. Yeah. And that's, that's the only the only reason that they interpret it that way is to save it. Mm. Because, obviously, if you take it that he meant when he said heaven and earth, he meant heaven and earth. Well, it didn't pass away at the time they were expecting it to pass away. 
hasn't yet. So, but, but you know, it's their argument is an argument of convenience or maybe even an argument of necessity because they don't want to admit that the prophecy was not fulfilled. Mm. Mm. Well put, well put. Thank you so much. <laughs> so uh, once again, here we are. I'd like to ask you this quite an interesting question. I do think this is interesting. Uh, we, Giving the model of early Christianity that is typically a consensus view, I think it's consensus. I could be wrong about this, so please don't take me to the bank. But that the idea that Christianity started out Jewish, like only Jewish people, yeah. and Gentiles start to find their way in. We kind of have a model, a, a fictional one yet, but a model in Acts painting this picture. But in this, in Matthew, we see that you will sit also on 12 thrones judging the 12 tribes of Israel. Now, some people want to equate where Paul talks about you will judge the angels, and an angel can be a human messenger to say that the angels are the 12 tribes of Israel. Um, but why doesn't Mark mention this 12 tribes of Israel? Maybe you can get a little deep into the pericope here. Well, uh, I'm not sure I have an answer as to why it mentions the 12 tribes of Israel. Uh, so, you know, they will presumably sit at the jury judging all the Israelites. But uh, I don't know anything in the Gospels that would lead me to think that those were the only people getting judged. You know, maybe these were the ones that the um, Jesus followers were best qualified to judge. But I surely do not think that, uh, that this was just a metaphor for the judgment of Israel. You know, I think uh, <clears> that the, the, there are a number of British scholars who have tended to that kind of uh, interpretation. Um, Tom Wright, I think, does. He's a very popular, influential writer. Can get him on sometime, maybe. Uh, but uh, I, I, I just don't think it's right. Now, are you speaking of the angels and the Israelites here, or is? Well, I'm. I'm saying angels are heavenly beings. Got it. Heaven and earth are heaven and earth. <laughs> <laughs> Was being and, and resurrection of the dead is resurrection of the dead. You know, it's not um, a metaphor for something else. Wow. Now, one. What if one's pushing back and they said, "But, but, but, look at Ezekiel, Doctor Collins. It, it's a metaphor yeah. for Israel's resurrection, and it, it isn't taken it's, literal." Yeah, and in Ezekiel, they tell you that. And the, it, an there is a change vision that explains that it is that. So it's almost like the idea. This I don't want to get off into the rabbit trail, but the change does uh, happen over time. The idea of resurrection does evolve. Oh yes. Okay. Yes, definitely. And uh, you know, in Ezekiel, um, I think also maybe in Isaiah twenty-six, it's a it is a metaphor for the restoration of Israel. But then um, you know, in Daniel, the the wise who were raised up then shine like the stars forever and ever. And the forever and ever is meant seriously. So forever it, means forever. You know, yeah. Now they had words that meant that, right? It wasn't they just had, to the end of your life. Yeah. So admittedly, they probably thought of forever as just a very, very, very long time. Right. Okay. You know, I don't think they had a concept of eternity the way it evolved later on. Uh, I think they just thought of it as a time where you can't imagine the end of it. Okay. Uh, there, there's a passage in one of the books of Enoch that says that the fallen angels think that they will live forever and that each of them will live 500 years. <laughs> <laughs> Is 500 years forever? Yeah, we take it. <laughs> you <Wow>. know? <clears throat> I wish I didn't get rid of the pericopes that actually deal with that because there's some that it mentions forever and ever and that yeah. you know, to get you to think about them. By the first century, though, do you think they have this – this idea is a very long time even if they don't have eternity in mind? That's right. Okay. But, but it, it's – you know, forever and ever 
it, it's like stretching out so that you can see an end to it. Well put. Thank you so much. Okay, um, we are moving on into Axe for a second here. Mm -hmm. And in Axe, there's this funny place. I call it funny. I love this chapter. Paul is just moved by the spirit. He goes in front of all of these Epicureans and Stoics, and he has to let them know. And he just uh, he says, look, I see all these idols you got. And, and I see that you're very religious and devout. Uh, and he says, that, you know, I found a mountain in this altar with the inscription to an unknown God. What therefore you worship as unknown, this I proclaim to you. The God who made the world and everything in it. Now, let, I just want to pause as we go, just to get your clarification. The God who made the world and everything in it. Does that mean exactly what that says? Yep. There's not anything that God did. No reason to think it doesn't. Yep. Okay. He who is Lord of heaven and earth. Heaven and earth yep. is above us or everything encompassing us and above us. And then, of course, earth is. Yep. Okay. Okay. Does not live in shrines made by human hands. I think that's self you know, evident. Nor is he served by human hands as though he needed anything. Himself having given all life and breath and all things, he made from one person an entire human race. Is that one person, Adam? Yep. Okay. Yep. To inhabit the entire face of the earth. Is this... Uh, this is Adam and all mankind on the planet. That's, that's what they thought. Yeah. To inhabit the entire face of the earth, having allotted presets, times, and the boundaries of places of the places they would live to seek God and perhaps to eat, to reach out for each, or I'm sorry, and uh, to reach out for and find him, though indeed he is not far from each one of us. For in him we live, and this is where he quotes uh, a pagan poet. Yep. I love this part. <laughs> And he says, your own poets have said, for we too are his offspring. Then he goes on to say, we ought not be uh, ought not consider the deity to be like gold or silver or stone formed by the art of imagination of mortals. So God, having overlooked the times of ignorance, which seems to be the idea that they, they, they didn't know beforehand that this was not allowed. And now Paul's saying, listen, you got to turn from your idols. Uh, anyway. The times of ignorance now commands all people everywhere to repent. Does he really mean everyone? Yep. Okay. Because he has fixed a day on which he will judge. I know this seems common sense, yeah. but I really want to get you on record just clarifying this. Um, he has fixed a day on which he will judge inhabited world in righteousness by a man whom he has appointed. Now, he's telling these pagans, if I can use the term, that he's going to judge the world and everyone needs to repent and turn from their idols and worship yeah. the one true God. This is like... The amazing thing is some people believed him. <laughs> <laughs> I love you. You're, you're just... Oh, man. Yeah. But this is what they believed, and this is just uh, yeah. clearly in the Greek obvious that this is what's being said. I just wanted to yeah. clarify Okay, yeah. it would it would do it would do damage to try and reinterpret this to mean one man meaning uh, Abraham or one man meaning uh, Israel or to uh, Moses. Yep, yeah, yep. Yeah, yeah. Okay, cool. I, I I'm I'm just happy to have you here to to deal with stuff that's simple. Now I I wanted to this is a side trail for one moment before we get into Second Peter three that I wanted to just get your clarification yeah. on. This is where your, your wonderful wife has written. And when I emailed her, she said, I'm in retirement. You need to just bother my <laughs> husband. <laughs> so I'm sure you're well aware, probably spent countless nights mm -hmm. talking to her about revelation. Um, and I wanted mm -hmm. to ask a simple question. The 144,000 Israelites in revelation seven, and the great multitude that no one could number from every nation, from all tribes and peoples and language. Are they the same group? Or are they two uh, separate no, groups? No, I don't think so. Uh, I think the 144,000 are the Israelites. Now, you know, I don't think any of these numbers should be pressed. Mm -hmm. Right. You know, I think it's a symbolic number. It's a rounded number. You know, it's 12 times 12,000. And so because you have 12 tribes, you have the going 12s. And, you know, like forever, this is such a big number that, you know, it's kind of out of sight. 
But then after that, a great multitude that no one could number from every nation and all tribes. And uh, <clears throat> hmm. okay. yeah. Revelation 14 kind of repeats this. Uh, it's yeah. repetitive. Same thing, two groups. Yeah. Making sure. Okay. Um, those who dwell, every nation, tribe, kindred, and tongue. And then um, we have this interesting thing in Revelation 21. It's talking about the 12 gates, 12 angels, 12 tribes. And finally, you talk, there's this part here. It talks about this lamp is the lamb. By its light will the nations walk, and the kings of the earth will bring the glory. Is this that, that idea throughout the Hebrew Bible and other literature where in the end the nations will come and recognize you, on Mount Zion, like your God, except this is a new heavens and new earth with the new Jerusalem, right? That's right. And you know, in Isaiah chapter two, it's Mount Zion who is lifted up, and the Torah goes out from it, and the Torah is the light. And for for John in Revelation, it's the Lamb, which is Jesus. Is the light. excellent. You are awesome. Okay. This book right here, among many, he's written many books, uh, oftentimes yes. is very repetitive, <laughs> but nonetheless, it is the elements shall melt with fervent heat. And if you see that picture, ladies and gentlemen, this is supposed to be a picture of Jerusalem in the first century burning up. And so there is a group that is called Full Preterist. I came out of this group as a fundamentalist Christian because I wanted to save the Savior. That's what I wanted to do mm -hmm. because I couldn't see him fail. So cognitive dissonance causes reinterpretation, which forces you, as you said earlier, to find ways to make it work. And it's a clever position. James Stuart Russell. Have you ever heard of him? Uh, I'm not sure. I may have, but I, I don't have any clear impression of him. He was one of the proponent, major proponents who wrote quite an interesting book about yeah. this idea. But, um, this second Peter three passage, if I could read it to you and kind of tease out what they think, and then maybe you tell me what it, what is really going on, what is really expected by the authors here. Mm -hmm. He talks about, this is my second letter written to you, which is probably if, uh, you know, not written by Peter. So someone else is writing this probably because the end did not happen, but we'll get there in both of them. I've aroused you your sincere mind by way of reminder that you should remember the predictions of the holy prophets and the commandment of the Lord and Savior through your apostles. First of all, you must understand this, that scoffers will come in the last days with scoffing, following their own passions and saying, where is the promise of his coming? For ever since the fathers fell asleep, all things have continued as they were from the beginning of creation. They deliberately ignore this fact, that by the word of God, heavens existed long ago and the earth formed out of water by means of water through which the word that then existed was deluged with water and perished. And, but by the same word, the heavens and earth that now exist have been stored up for fire, being kept until the day of judgment and destruction of ungodly men. But do not ignore this one fact, beloved, that with the Lord, one day is as a thousand years and a thousand years as one day. The yeah. Lord is not slow about his promise, as some count slowness, but is forbearing toward you, not wishing that any should perish, but that all should reach repentance, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. It'll come like a day in the night. And he says, then the heavens will pass away with a loud noise and the elements will be dissolved with fire and the earth and the works that are upon it will be burned up. Now they say, and then I want you to give your, what's really going on here. This is probably, I mean, he's a church of Christ, you know, mm -hmm. preterist. They mm -hmm. say that this is the Jerusalem temple. Heaven and earth is most likely the covenant people of God. Uh, they find this passage where, where Moses says, mm -hmm. give ear, O heavens, and listen, O earth. And he spoke to the Israelites. And they they literally, like, make that yeah. heaven mm -hmm. and earth the Israelites. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah. They do that. They say the temple is what was melted and its elements were melted in 70 AD. So they make all of these arguments to make this fit. What's actually happening in second Peter three global warming <laughs> on a grand scale. <laughs> if you want, actually, I think, uh, Ann Coulter said the real global warming, but she was referring, she meant hell. <laughs> 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 but, but, um, uh, <laughs> you know, I mean, uh, quite literally, it is. Uh, 
a, a universal configuration is what they're talking about. And you know, this idea what was around for a while. Um, you also get it in the Stoics. You also get it in Persian eschatology, the idea that the mountains will melt, become like a stream of molten metal. And you get it a few times in the Hebrew Bible, but then you begin to get it a lot in some apocalyptic and quasi-apocalyptic writings. The Sibylline Oracles, the work say wrote my dissertation on, this mm -hmm. is a big theme, the destruction of the earth by fire. So, and see, there's a yeah. I was just gonna say, so, so clearly, uh, it's it would be very convoluted to get to the New Testament when all of its surrounding Jewish <clears throat> literature yeah. is purporting something very similar in the same milieu in the same kind of idea, and then get to the New Testament and say, this doesn't mean what all these other things are implying. It would be very, very odd. Yeah. Wow. Well, ladies and gentlemen, you can wrap things up. No, I'm just <laughs> it's yeah. always, you know, you've read so much and I, I, you've written up more than I probably will ever uh, be able to even cover. I mean, I'm looking at your Hebrew Bible third edition. This is such a nice, wonderful, uh, deep dive into this material and then your apocalyptic literature. So if I were to try and press you and say, well, prove it, tell me any other literature where you know it's universal and that you know it's end of history or you know that it's something more than this small limited scope because they limit it to israel can you prove in other apocalyptic literature around the time the new testament was written well you know look at the book of revelation i think it's quite clear you know it goes through a lot of imagery of destruction and then it has a clean break and then a new creation. And another one from about the same time is called Fourth Ezra or Second Esdras. Mm. And there to the whole, the earth is returned to primeval silence for seven days. Why? So that people will know, you know that uh, uh, it's to clearly mark that this is not just a, a metaphor for uh, for something that's changing in the world. So to put it real simple, <clears throat> yeah. it failed. There's yeah. no way around that. Right. I know that sounds so well, simple. You know, I, I mean, in a way, uh, the, the way Second Peter puts it is uh, is unfalsifiable. Mm -hmm. Because it says, with the Lord, you know, a thousand years is as a day. So, and he didn't say how many days. Yeah. <laughs> so, you know, uh, if you take it, the book of Daniel does give a specific number of days before the end, whatever he meant by it. And I think, you know, he didn't really mean the end of the world. I think he meant um, the end of the persecution in Jerusalem uh, and certainly a time of great change. Uh, but... Uh, you know, down through the centuries, then people have taken the days and Daniel and said, well, each of those is a thousand years or a hundred years. But of course, if you really took them as a thousand years, nothing is going to happen for God knows how long. Because, you know, if you have, if you have 1,250 days, now, if you make that into 1,250,000 years, <laughs> Then <laughs> we're not going to be around, I'm afraid, to see if that's uh, if anything happens at that point. I think you the know. red flag is that they were expecting it, and he, and there are already people mocking it. There are scoffers yeah. because it didn't happen. So now they're like, no, 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 no. The, yeah. Okay. Question then. Question then. Um, and I wanted to see if I was right in my thinking on this, just to have your critical uh, agreement or disagreement, and tell me where you think my thinking's wrong or right. In Matthew 24, Luke 21, Mark 13. The way I understood this is Mark's our earliest, Matthew and Luke, no Mark. So they're kind of rehashing these stories. They're probably thinking potentially there's an apocalypse to come very soon. It might be tomorrow, might be next Thursday, might be next year, but it's soon. It's not like way off into the future. Yeah. Mark is writing this as, as though all of these signs you're going to see, 
the, the army surrounding Jerusalem, this destruction of the 70 AD, this is a sign that God's going to interject into history and change the whole game. This is not the end, meaning all of these signs itself are not the evidence to show the end happened. These are like right before what is going to happen. Right. Am I, okay. All right. academics think this. Why Actually, don't I, oh. I must, uh, I must look. I have, I gave a paper at a conference in Moscow, actually, in September of 2019. Good thing it's not uh, this year. <laughs> on, yes, indeed. <laughs> uh, on, uh, mainly on Mark 13. And it was largely directed against the interpretation of Tom Wright. Mm. Tom Wright was an Anglican bishop. Uh, I don't think he functions as a bishop anymore. I don't know if one remains a bishop for life. Uh, but an enormously influential kind of popular evangelical writer. Not a fundamentalist now, but uh, let's say on the evangelical end of the spectrum. And uh, he was very much inclined to interpret all of this as being fulfilled, you know, in the, in the fall of Jerusalem and so forth. So I must uh, dig that out and send it to you. Please do. I would really appreciate it because that's how mm -hmm. I understand it now is that it didn't happen. I think there's even a clue when it says, and his name's Tom. Is it N.T. Wright? Yes. N.T. Wright. Okay, um, you call him yeah. Tom Wright. Yeah, I need yeah. to see this because from what I understand in this whole Mark, um, Mark, Matthew, Luke, you know, apocalypse, uh, maybe not the right word. Um, I, I understood that in Mark, Jesus says, which is kind of a clue red flag to me, but not even the son of man knows the day or the hour. Like, like get me off the hook. Okay. Like, yeah. like, like it's going to yeah. happen. We just don't want to say when, cause goodness yeah. gracious. Yeah. Huge clue. Right. Yeah. Now, you know, my favorite um, example of this kind of thing is in the book of Daniel where he does actually give you several numbers. You know, first of all, it, it's 1,150 days. Then it's 1,250 or something like that. And then 1,300. Uh, and then at the end of the book, it gives you, you know, the highest number yet. But then in the very next verse, happier those who persevere and come to and it's a higher number again. Now, this seems to me to be quite transparently a case where, you know, they predicted a date and it passed. So they recalculated. <laughs> it's a famous book on this phenomenon by Leon Festinger, written in the 1950s. And it was mainly about the Millerites. You know who the Millerites were? In the 1840s, mm -hmm. William Miller out in Ohio, you know, calculated on the basis of the book of Daniel when the world was going to end. And a number of people took this very seriously and sold their belongings and went off and assembled on a mountaintop. And then when nothing happened, they said they wept and wept until the day dawned. But, you know, they didn't just disband. Some of them <laughs> ended up as the Seventh-day Adventists. So, but what Festinger said is the last thing you can expect a person to do in a situation like that is say, I was wrong. Actually, Harold Camping, you know, who engaged oh, in yeah. this kind of thing uh, almost 10 years ago, uh, was the exception. You know, this time he actually said, well, I guess I was wrong. Yeah, but that's after yeah. his second time of getting it wrong. Then he... Right. Yes, yeah, yeah. But, but uh, I don't know of anybody before him in the whole history of millenarian expectation whoever said they were wrong, no matter how often they got it wrong. Wow. That's, that, it's like almost like uh, if it walks like a duck and it talks like a duck, you know, it, it, it's so obvious that this would be the pattern that they would all go yeah. into. So I think, uh, wouldn't you agree the new Testament and especially like in the gospel of John is trying to get away a little from that apocalyptic expectation. Yeah, I think so. 
I think so. And also, you know, the pastoral epistles, no talk really about the second coming. It's like buckle down, make yourselves respectable in this world. Um, now, those epistles often get reviled because they come across as very reactionary or conservative. Uh, conservative, you know, by the social mores of the time. Uh, but uh, you can see where they were coming from. You know, that they were reacting against these people who thought the whole thing was going up. Wow. And, you know, even in the book of Acts, um, at first, they, they sell all their belongings and have everything in common. You can do that if you think there's a spaceship coming for you in a week. <laughs> you know, or in a month. But you can't keep that up forever. Well put. Yeah, that is so well put. So uh, the book of Revelation, mm -hmm. what, what's, what's it about? I have to ask because there's some people who think it's all about Israel. They honestly think that it is – so how do I put this to make it short, sweet, and simple? They believe that the book of Revelation is written, even if they say it was written after 70. Some of them will say it was written after 70. Some of them argue to try and be conservative that this is written before – probably yeah. for theological reasons, yeah, yeah. but but they believe that it's all about Israel and the bad people that are mm -hmm. kind of described in this are the kind of the Pharisees that Jesus is rebuking in the Gospels. So they don't take Rome as the bad people that are actually going to be destroyed. Well, no, I mean, it is all about Rome. Now, I mean, the thing that... that um, Protestant Christians have often done is say, yeah, it's about Rome, the Roman Catholic Church, <laughs> which, of course, <laughs> which of course didn't exist at the time. Uh, but no, yeah, sure, it's a reaction to the Roman Empire. That Rome, you know, is the beast, and the, 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 the whore of Babylon sitting on the beast with the seven heads and seven hills and so forth. And that, that's all quite clear. Now, that also shows you whatever else you say about the revelation of, of John, it has a universal scope. You know, it's addressing the whole world. And that's because, you know, the Roman Empire, you know, extended to the whole world as they knew it at the time. And so what John wanted to say is, no, it's not the Roman Emperor, it's Jesus. And it's kind of Jesus as Roman emperor in, to, to some degree. So, you know, it's a very political book in that way. Now, but having said that, you know, it's not just, in the, there are passages in the Hebrew Bible. It's a passage about Babylon that talks about the stars falling from heaven. Mm -hmm. And I think that one is obviously metaphorical. Uh, but I don't, I think in the case of Revelation, he really expected it to, that Rome would crumble, that Rome would crash. And when people <clears throat> see that 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 <throat> metaphorical use in the Old Testament or Hebrew Bible, you see stuff like Babylon's destruction. Yeah, the the stars will fall, or the mountains will melt, or uh, the earth will split asunder. Like wild language that might be apocalyptic, and 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 I mean metaphorical uh, for a serious event taking place. Yeah local not really universal um how if if you're trying to get that person who's in agreement with you on that to think universal and say no this is different here in the new testament i mean maybe they need to take like a bunch of college courses to see the development happening here like learn why the yeah. language and stuff. Yeah. but how yeah. would you you know i think what what it comes down to really is i mean with, with understanding any of this literature you have to put it in a context and it depends what other literature you're reading. Now, part of the problem with some of these praetorists is the only other literature they're reading is the Old Testament. And then you can try to assimilate the New Testament to the Old. Mm. But if you're reading the non-canonical apocalypses, if you're reading the Dead Sea Scrolls, if you're reading Greek and Roman literature of the time, if you read the Stoics, then 
you know, they, there was in the Hellenistic period a quite new concept of history as a totality. This is, you know, part of what's entailed by a cosmos. It's a bounded universe. And they thought of the physical world as a unit that way, and they thought of time as a unit that way, and therefore something that could come to an end, or at least you could go from one eon to another. Now, you didn't have those sorts of ideas back in the time of the, the prophets in the Hebrew Bible. That was such a great point. I've got one more pericope, well, maybe two more pericopes to bring up and get your thoughts on. Okay. The next one we're getting into is Josephus. There's this really interesting passage where, to, to give you a little background, um, Jesus talks about there were, uh, for example, Matthew 16. There are some of you who are standing here will not taste death until the Son of Man comes with his angels to repay each man according to their deeds. I kind of have this memorized from all yeah. the years that I used to do this. And it's this idea that the angels will come with Jesus and Jesus talks about the son of man will come on the clouds. So you could see like one plus one, the way people connect the Bible, you have this idea that Jesus is going to come on the clouds with angels to repay each man according to their deeds. And this is the judgment that will finally come. They want to say this is 70 AD and why look at Josephus. Josephus says, and they found this, and they go, ooh. And after the festival, not many days later, on the 21st of the month, Ar Artemi Artemisium, uh, I'm sorry, there appeared a miraculous phenomenon passing belief. Yeah. Indeed, what I am about to relate <laughs> would I imagine have been deemed a fable were it not for the narratives of eyewitnesses, because they're so trustworthy, um, and for the subsequent what? calamities, which have deserved to be signaled. For before sunset, through all, all the parts of of the country chariots were seen in the air and armed battalions hurtling through the clouds and encompassing encompassing the city they uh, cities they say don't you see this is the final judgment on jerusalem because jesus talks about coming on the clouds isn't this jesus coming on the clouds dr collins well josephus certainly didn't think it was jesus coming on the clouds Right. And now, you know, this business of seeing chariots charging in the air and that stuff is old. And certainly in the Hellenistic world, you get it in Second Maccabees, uh, you know, in a time of foreboding. I mean, you could imagine some prophet going around in the Ukraine last week, seeing tanks rolling in the sky or something. <laughs> you know, it's a sense of foreboding that something awful is going to happen. So I think that's what he's getting on there. It's also kind of melodramatic writing that it, it uh, you know, it uh, paints up the picture of something really horrible happening. It's really outlandish. So that, that's part of what is going on. Now, I don't think uh, Josephus was really into the idea of an end of history. I don't think, I think for Josephus, you see, this line of interpretation might work just fine. That it's just the end of Jerusalem. But no, there, there was a good tradition of that kind of thing too. But you see, Josephus will not then go on to talk about, and then the dead will be raised. And, you know, he might, uh, as you get in the Gospels, if you people have visions of the dead coming out of their tombs and that, that's just extraordinary event. That's all that is saying. Uh, in the, the apocalypses and something like the book of Revelation, they don't just come out of their tombs, they stay out. You know, where in even in the Gospels, you know, at the, the time of the crucifixion, presumably those that came out of their tombs you know, went back when it got to be evening and went back to sleep. Wow. Okay. Final, final one. We're tiptoeing around here. The last yeah. one I wanted to bring up is in Colossians. <clears throat> really interesting passage. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For in him, all things were created in heaven and on earth. I wonder what that means. Hmm. 
things visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or powers, all things through him and for him have been created. He himself is before all things and all things endure in him. What's going on here? Uh, well, there are a lot of things going on there. I mean, first of all, I mean, the idea that God created everything. That's, you know, fairly common Jewish idea by this time. And that includes the angels. Now, this would not have been thought a few hundred years earlier, but uh, that this would have been assumed by, by this time. Now, Colossians is talking about Christ. And what it's doing is in the Hebrew Bible, you have the idea of wisdom as a figure, and through wisdom, God creates the earth. Uh, Proverbs chapter 8. In Stoicism, you have the idea of the Logos. Now, Stoicism is a bit different because in, in real Stoicism, I think there wasn't a God above the Logos. Uh, but in some forms of Greek philosophy by this time, you still did have a god beyond the Logos. But the Logos, it's kind of what we call panentheism. You know, it's the divine element that pervades everything, holds mm -hmm. all things together. And then Jewish writers said, well, that's wisdom. And then the Gospel of John comes along, and this passage in Colossians, and say, no, actually, that's Christ. Ah, now you know how you actually imagine that is not at all easy, <laughs> but, uh, but that's the move that we're making. Isn't that also kind of implied in Acts 17? We read earlier, we talked about in Him we move, we breathe, we have our being. Yes, okay, just yeah, seeing I think, you know, in Acts, it's probably God simply, but but here it's more specifically Jesus. Because in the Gospel of John, you know, with the word in chapter one, and in passages like this, you have, it's really like the, the logos in Greek philosophy, or even like wisdom. There's a book called The Wisdom of Solomon. It's in the Catholic Bible, uh, which has a lot of this stuff. So that, you know, Jesus is kind of an intermediary figure between God and the world. And so everything is done through him. Hmm. Bravo. This has been a fantastic episode. Let me ask you this, Dr. Collins, before I end up uh, finishing this with you, if you were able to tell um, someone who's a student of the Bible, who's trying to really, they, they say, as everyone says, I want the truth. I want to know the truth. Um, but they have been very Bible interprets a Bible mindset. What advice could you give to someone who would be willing to do whatever to try and figure out the answers. What what kind of advice would you give to them? Well, you know, ideally, they should go to a school that isn't just repeating dogma and learn the languages. Now, yeah, I mean, it depends how much time they have to devote to this. Mm -hmm. You know, if this is somebody who's working along day shift <laughs> uh, well in that case you know you just got to look for advice on what to read but um you know just yesterday i i was in another zoom discussion and uh, this was on the book of daniel it's called daniel and islam but one of the people on the panel was um uh, what she called a progressive dispensationalist which I would consider a contradiction in terms. <laughs> but she was a very nice person. Uh, but, you know, she had a PhD from the University of Chicago. She was an academic all her life at Biola University. Mm -hmm. But still, when it came to interpreting the Bible, she had you know, the kind of thing you might get in the Schofield Reference Bible. And she just spouted all of that. Now, without apparently being at all aware that, you know, in a lot of places, no, nobody believes that. The people who actually know the languages and know about the ancient cultures don't read it that way. 
So that's what happens to people, I think, is that they get locked in. And you see, if all they know is what they're being told by their preacher, it's very hard to get to them. What if all they know is from this, they're trying to, themselves, right? They're, yeah. they're trying to connect dots. And, and, and the Bible interprets the Bible, so they find these, like I talked about earlier, you will judge the 12 tribes. Well, we know angel can mean a messenger, a human messenger. Oh, therefore, oh. they are judging the angels, etc. You see, and they're not learning that from their pastor. They're going off into this, I like to call it fundamentalist methodology of thinking. Oh, that's yeah, true. it's like the Bible interprets the Bible, but they haven't really went and said, hmm, how does this, the... This was one of the great disasters of the Protestant Reformation, Derek. The idea that anybody can just read the Bible and interpret it for themselves. Now, there are, I think, bits of the Bible where that's true enough. Mm -hmm. I think anybody can read the Gospels pretty much. But now, uh, you know, if, if you start reading the book of Ezekiel or you, you start reading the book of Revelation, you need a little help, you know. And, uh, <laughs> well, <clears throat> you know, I think we've, it's the same mentality that we have, um, you know, with the conspiracy theorists and the, the people, the anti-vaxxers. Mm -hmm. You know, don't trust the people who say they know something about it. Just... Trust whoever your local demagogue is. Wow. Because I find that same mentality in these groups. Yeah. They think that way as well. So, yeah. yeah. Wow. you I didn't oh. tell you any of that. You already knew. That's wild. <laughs> <laughs> you knew this would connect. You so, interpreted so it. Up good work, Derek. <laughs> well, thank you so much, ladies and gentlemen. Be sure to go down in the description. Get his books. And also, um, I have a GoFundMe. I'm trying to go to Israel in October. I'd like to go sit in the throne seat that Pontius Pilate uh, actually would cast a verdict of innocent or guilty. Help us do that. Join the Patreon because this will be on Patreon first. Thank you to everyone who helps me on my Patreon. I really mean that. I really appreciate you, Dr. Collins. You are the man.